video games are a remarkable way to both tell and experience stories. They invite you to enter worlds of action, fantasy, terror, and wonder. Not just a member of the audience, but an active participant. They are stories that are shaped not only by the visions of their creators, but by the choices you make as they unfold. They are changed by you, just as you are changed by them. This year, for the first time, Tribeca has selected eight games. We hope they offer you a brief glimpse into the ingenuity and artistic scope that games have to offer the world. And why they belong at the forefront of our conversations about storytelling, both now and in the future. We can't wait for you to play them. Horror stories are often about uh, seeing our deepest fears and anxieties made real in the form of ghosts, uh, ghouls, and demons. But in the survival horror game, Signalis, uh, the true horror lies not in the shambling monsters uh, you find lurking in a subterranean bunker or an alien planet, but in what lies beyond the limits of human comprehension. Revelations so dreadfully that can shatter the mind. This is the cosmic horror of Signalis. Canterbridge of Spirits is a rich, compelling tale of fantasy and adventure with themes of trauma and loss of forgiveness. And yes, it's full of fast-paced action and breathless battles with supernatural foes, but the first thing that hits you when you see it is the beauty of a debut game from a small but passionate team at Ember Labs, and how the stunning animation of its lush, magical world pulls you into a journey of a spirit guide trying to save a village haunted by restless souls. But why not let you see it for yourself? Here's our next official selection, Canterbridge of Spirits. Ground yourself. 
feel the energy of the mountain. Draw on its power. Ember Lab is a really small studio. Uh, we have a background in uh, film and animation. Uh, we got our start doing visual effects for films. And then from there, we grew into doing a lot of uh, animated work for commercials. In between commercial projects, we would always siphon off some time to learn new things and you know, be a little creative. And over time, you know, we, we decided that, wow, we have a real passion for games. Um, and we wanted to throw our hat into the ring with the, our first project, Kena. <laughs> Something tells me you did not come to our village looking for forest creatures. Hello, spirit. I seek passage to the Sacred Mountain Shrine. We've been playing games our whole lives together as brothers. Um, and. The action adventure games are sort of what we play together and we also enjoy. Yeah. We kind of had this idea of the rot being a kind of a force of nature that was maybe working against you. It was kind of the enemy initially. And then I kind of had the uh, thought to flip it where the rot, be rot become your companions. And that's when we kind of like found that we, we had something kind of unique. <laughs> uh, it opened up a lot of cool mechanics, especially with the puzzles in the game. You know, you, in, with film, you can just put the camera where you want it, you can tell, you can. You have complete control over what they're seeing, when they're seeing it, how they're seeing it. And in games, all that goes out the window. So communicating ideas or themes to the player is a lot more difficult, we found. Yeah. You have to be really sort of crafty in how you're getting communication to the player, um, especially when it's trying, you're trying to do it through gameplay and not just like always through cutscene. One of Tara's memories. I should see what leads me. We love creating immersive experiences, and we try to really think about atmosphere and tone a lot when we're when we're in on the game development side. The storytelling and atmosphere is a big part of our traditional medium in terms of film aesthetics. Just having the world be something that you want to sit down and explore and be a part of um, was a goal of ours from the beginning. Having a nice uh, team of, of really great animators who have worked together, I think was paramount in terms of pulling off some of the, the storytelling you want to do with the game. We're actually making like a 45 minute animated movie inside of a game. Hi. We're really proud of the team. A lot of them come from the visual effects and animation background and kind of like converted their skill sets from the film and animation background into um, developers on, on the game side. During the process of making the game, we also were introduced to a musical group called Tsudamani. And we actually, you know, Jason and myself went over to Bali to do recording for the, the soundtrack. Wow. 
one of the things that's grown out of that relationship is uh, Dewa is, is, is the composer, but his daughter Ayu is actually the voice of Kena. My name's Kena. What are you two doing out here? She's never done any voice acting, but she fit right in. It's okay. You have to go now. You know, we wanted to make a game that would just excite us if we saw it. You know, something that we would see the trailer. Oh yeah, that's that game looks awesome. Yeah. So it, as difficult as as it has been, it's also very rewarding because it's like something that we would be very proud of. Yeah. Something that we would want to pick up ourselves. You must move on. of a spirit guide is a lonely one. Southern Gothic is a uniquely American storytelling tradition, blending magical realism with dark tales of decay in the American South. Norco adds a dash of sci-fi to the Southern Gothic stew, weaving cyborgs and artificial intelligence into pixelated Louisiana landscapes, where the sun sets heavy and orange over the swamps, and oil refineries blaze like torches in the night. It is a place where people, memories, and secrets have a way of getting lost and buried. Dig them up if you dare in the haunting and extraordinary adventure that is Norco. Geography of Robots is a handful of devs, artists, and musicians making output that is largely centered around the American South and the psychogeography of the American South. Another one. Our first release is a game called Norco, which is about my hometown of Norco, Louisiana a small, very industrialized town about 25 miles upriver from New Orleans. There's so many intersecting pieces of infrastructure. So many stories embedded in the landscape. I've been fascinated with that region since I was a kid. I wanted to synthesize all of those research interests into something, and Norco is that culmination of effort. draws from both reality and certain sci-fi tropes. To explore little air pockets of the surreal within the reality of the game. The primary benefit that we have working in this sort of adventure game point and click genre is that we've got just decades and decades of iteration to build on within this genre, going back to the old uh, Lucas games, you know, Monkey Island and such. What works for our story? What are the necessary mechanics to tell the story of Norco? <laughs> I was interrogating a lot of events and experiences from the past. I was playing a lot of 
2D pixel art games at the time. A lot of traumatic events had occurred both in my personal life and the life of the region that I was exploring, and I thought there was a kind of hauntological element to using pixel art to tell those stories. I don't have any artistic experience, and so doing a simple 2D pixel art game fit the best within my limited resources that I had. In the more recent years, uh, big and small studios have really been uh, pushing like what it means for player agency to take a front seat in a semi-linear narrative. It has been an interesting journey, pushing the boundaries of the medium and kind of forcing it into this more complex, uncomfortable future. In the handmade adventure game Harold Halibut, a spaceship full of people fleeing the Cold War crash lands in an alien ocean, where the sunken ship becomes a city that is forever stuck in the 1970s. And when I say handmade adventure game, I mean that in a very physical, tangible way. Every set, every character, every floorboard, and every coffee cup has been meticulously handcrafted from wood, clay, cloth, and metal to bring this gorgeous world to life. I'm pleased to introduce the stop-motion adventure, Harold Halibut. Slow Brothers, a tiny interdisciplinary game studio based in Cologne, Germany. Harold! Stop daydreaming! And don't forget to fix the light after cleaning up the paint! Sometimes I do wonder what life would have been like on Earth. It's been about 10 years since we started game development. Uh, some of us have a film background and at that time we were kind of frustrated about the big budgets needed to produce a feature-length film, the dependencies to producers. Being also game lovers, we thought that making a game instead of a film to tell a story might be the more approachable endeavor. We quickly realized that the budgeting thing, at least, wasn't too different from feature-length films, but we were <laughs> way too deep into the process already when, when we realized that. <laughs> Our goal has always been to create a accurate recreation of, of a stop-motion film to create a cinematic feel and our initial approach was quite a lot of experimentation involved until we found our process that we use now which is 3D scanning everything by using photogrammetry to create 3D models of the characters that we then animate using motion capturing. which gave us this fluidity and also all the options that we have in modern 3D games to light the scenes in a cinematic way and to use camera movement. So uh, it's, it's even a little bit different than you know traditional stop motion animation and we really liked this mix of the digital world and the analog world. We've 
heard a bunch of people questioning why we put such effort into building the sets and the tiny details. Ultimately, we think that's why the game feels the way it does is because of the sum of its parts and that level of detail coming together as like a greater thing. We just like put a lot of effort into giving the individual characters and Harold's social environment a lot of depth and that ultimately makes for like a rich experience. Now, if you're quite ready. Sure. Um, ready for what? I made a breakthrough discovery at the Arboretum last night. You remember the last batch of bloomy rocks? Oh, the really small ones from the last intake? The ones with the strange shapes and the little holes and... The blue ones, yes. Turns out their surface composition doesn't just give us clues about our immediate aquatic environs. I think they've picked up some influences from outer space as well. We create a relatable science fiction world instead of having a super distant sci-fi future where things are so different that it might as well be magic. It may have started with one man, but it took the hearts and minds of many more to make the dream a reality. That dream began at the height of the Cold War, when the world was on the very brink of annihilation. He conceived of an arc-like spacefaring ship. After 200 years, we finally arrived at our destination, only to find that the promising, watery planet contained no habitable landmass and dense, toxic gases in the atmosphere. The Cold War seemed like a good starting point for the backstory of our game and it enabled us to have this kind of weird mix of being stuck in the 70s on one hand and not living through the things we all know in our present, but also thinking into the future, the 200 years after that, um, and creating this kind of alternative timeline where things evolved in a different way. It's just that the professor and I need some sea rocks, I mean filter rocks from older times, that have come from the filters, and I feel like you might have one. Okay, look and listen here, Longy Long Pants. I shut the store for a reason, you know? While we have this overarching storyline in our game with multiple story arcs, um, Harold is only one part of this bigger story, and we always kind of focus on Harold's personal interactions, relationships and friendships of Harold. Harold! Good timing. You can explain things to the Major, can't you? Harold, come here and explain things. So, Harry, how's life been treating you? Uh, you know, keeping fishy. What? Uh, you know, keeping busy. Okay. Harold. Is everything okay? And therefore really concentrated on providing a lot of depth in those characters for players to ultimately explore. Harold, won't you stay? The jog team won't be the same without you. Yeah, venga, Harold. You can't leave now, I just got here. Jog team, jog team, jog team. Go jog team. <laughs> Come on, Harold, keep up. Deep breaths, Harold, you're doing great. Guys, <sighs> have you got any tips? Just keep on moving, Harold. You never know when you'll have to slow down. So keep going while you can. Yeah, that is so cute. Imagine setting off across a vast desert on a rite of passage, with no one to share the long and lonely trip but your trusty hover bike. On your journey to the horizon, you will traverse a world of beauty and mystery, full of spectacular ruins, both ancient and futuristic. This is the joy of exploration, the thrill of discovery. And if you listen to the stories of the people and places you encounter, perhaps a chance to learn what you came here to understand. This is Sable.
is us. Um, I'm Greg, this is Daniel, and we started out in my parents' shed. Sable is the main character. She's a young girl who's leaving her home for the first time. The gliding is what Sable embarks on as the story starts, and it's something that everybody who comes of age in the world of Sable does. It's how you find out what you want to become in life. Leaving your home behind and experiencing the world, meeting people, trying things, helping folks in need, and ultimately deciding what do I want to devote my life to. So much of the people here, the communities here, are defined by their vocation. You know, the desert that they live in is inhospitable, and so they've kind of had to come together and had to form groups around resources. And so Sable kind of goes from place to place, meeting different societies and cultures, built around completely different experiences of the same environment. It means that she has to be a sponge, right? She's trying to figure out her place in the world, what she wants to do for the rest of her days. And I think that's what makes the story so fun. It really is about the places that you go, the people that you see, and the experiences that you have that not only shape her gliding, but shape her. My dad and Daniel's dad went to architecture school together. You know, our lives have kind of crossed a bit in that period. Uh, your mum taught me art at secondary school. By the time we were at sort of university age, that was when indie games had really kind of taken off as a creative sort of field. I started to think that it was something that I could paint myself. I studied architecture, Daniel studied comparative literature, but neither of us had any experience making games before we started making games. We kind of went to the pub one time and um, had a chat about how we, because we had none of these industry direct connections to skills or, or experience, we thought we'd start our own internship, do our own internship in the, in the shed. <laughs> The initial thought was just, let's get some experience under our belt and see where we go from there. Somehow, six years or so later, we're, we're here and now, still going. Still going. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that we've really tried to focus on is exploration. And we kind of geared every design decision that we could around that focus. There's no real danger to the player in the game. It is quite relaxing in a way, but that doesn't make it less curious a world to explore, I think. I think the unique thing about it is how lonely it is, and the pace of the game is very uh, laid back. It was the first game that we designed that was really geared around our skills as well, our backgrounds. We wanted to do something narrative focused, and we had to do a background in comparative literature, we wanted something to do architectural, architecturally focused, and my background in architecture helped with that. So I think that it's come from us in that yeah. way makes it quite unique. We draw from a number of references and influences, I suppose. I guess some of the most obvious ones are the, the visual ones, right? Stuff like uh, Mobius or um, or Tintin, Herb, or um, Studio Ghibli, and the, you know those kind of pieces were always influential. 
yeah, it does have that mix of ancient and futuristic to our eyes, right, who live here, but to the eyes of Sable and to everyone in that world, that is all that they know. We brought that new breakfast onto the project really early on, like before we'd really started it. And so our music has kind of been there from the very beginning. So that's been, a, the music itself has been a really big part of shaping, shaping like the, the direction of the game. In the gothic fairy tale Lost in Random, the world is divided into six shadowy realms, where every citizen's fate is determined by the roll of a cursed die. You play as Even, a young girl who's set out on a quest to save her beloved sister, Odd. And with the help of your companion, a magical living die named Dicey, you'll find yourself battling your way through a dark wonderland, and if you want to win the game, you'll have to embrace the chaos and find a way to tip the odds in your favor. From the Odd and Even minds of Zoink Games, here is Lost in Random. So Lost in Random is being developed here at Swing Games in Gothenburg, Sweden. We have about 80 developers with a few different projects, but Lost in Random is definitely our biggest and most ambitious project ever. We're known for doing quite narrative-driven games. We really want to make games that speak to people and touch people and make people think. Lost in Random is a 3D action-adventure game set in the gorgeous gothic fairy tale world of Random. And it tells the tale of Even, a young girl who befriends Dicey, a living dice with incredible powers. Even goes on this journey to rescue her sister from the clutches of the Mad Queen, who's obsessed with board games. And so the Queen decreed that any child who had turned the age of 12 would be given the grand honor of rolling her one true dice to show them their place in the world of random. For random is fair, random prevails, and random rules. Random rules. Even, she's this naive, young kid who's just, for the first time, going out into the world to find out who she is. It's, it's really a story about the randomness of life and conquering the, the fear of it. Even and Dicey are a really fun duo. Even is this quick to anger, but she's not one to hold grudges, but she can easily get into a fight and Dicey is there to hold her back. Dicey, who is this cute puppy kind of character, his moment to shine is, is when you're in combat. When even rolls Dicey, he becomes this kind of Swiss army knife of magical power. No, Dicey. They should be scared of us. Right? We're really in love with this project. It's a great story, it's great actors, it's the innovative gameplay, and it just feels like everything is just so perfectly packaged together around the dice and, and this universe. And the style of the game is kind of like something out of a Laika or Tim Burton movie. It's really everything we've dreamt of doing all these years. It's really great, and we can't wait for everybody to play it. In the interactive thriller 12 Minutes, 
you play as a man who becomes trapped in a time loop, replaying the same 12 minutes of one fateful evening in his apartment over and over again. Each time you're going to have the chance to make new choices, learn what led up to those terrible events and perhaps even escape them. It's a story that's not just about how choices matter, but about how some stories can only truly be told when they can change, even just a little bit, every single time you retell them. It was a joy to participate in this project and lend my voice to the main character, and I hope you have as much fun playing it as I did making it. I am very proud to introduce a game where the end is only the beginning. 12 minutes. I have a surprise for you. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> you want to guess what it is? Hmm. <sighs> This is an outfit for a newborn. You bought it this morning. You wanted to surprise me. I'm sorry. You're pregnant. You know? I know because you already gave it to me. This has happened before. What are you talking about? What's going on? Someone is coming. He's going to hurt us. He says you killed your father. I need to know what happened. Why are you doing this? My father died. died of a heart attack? No, I, 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 I didn't have anything to do with... Any second now, he's gonna knock on that door. Help me. This isn't happening. This can't be happening. Police, open up. My name is Luis. I am the creator of 12 Minutes. I grew up watching a lot of film. They always captivated me and I tried to understand what were they doing. The, the pacing, the colors, the lighting, the, the composition in order to, to create this, these emotions in me. What are the tools we have as game designers that allow us to do similar things? I think the biggest challenge is that usually when we think about narrative, we think about a linear progression. And in an interactive game, at least in 12 minutes, that information can come at any moment depending on what you've done. What's the occasion? I'll tell you over dessert. All right, I'm ready to get wowed by this dessert. Just give me one second. You know, I, I'm fascinated by the idea of if you knew what's going to happen, what would you do differently? 12 Minutes is an interactive thriller about a man trapped in a time loop. You come home from work, you're having a, an evening with your wife, then this, this, this cop shows up, he accuses your wife of murder. Hands behind your back, let's go. You try to stop him, you get beat up. Stop. Somebody help! <laughs> only to wake up back to the start of the evening. And then you have to use the knowledge of what you know it's going to happen to try to change the outcome and break the loop. Look, I know this sounds weird, but... The day's repeating itself. What do you mean, repeating itself? I'm living the same chunk of time, over and over again. Uh-huh. The reason the game sticks to a bird's eye view is because it allows you to very easily interact with the environment. Most video games, you have a third-person camera or a first-person camera, and I wanted to create something that is very accessible. So by doing a bird's eye view, you have like a floor plan of the apartment that you just click where to move, There was also the challenge of having the voices convey the emotions without seeing the faces. If someone is really stressed out, uh, you won't have any facial expression, so you have to feel the stress in the throat. Particularly because you don't see our faces in it, you really are projecting whatever you're feeling onto the character. There's no facial expressions that are instructing you. Where you go in the game will, I think, depend on you as an, an individual. I just need some time to myself. Come on, babe, please, stop it. And if there's enough subtlety in the voice acting, in the movement, your brain will feel the rest. Because actors think in terms of motivations. You know, what's my motivation for this scene? And workshopping with them, figuring those things out, allows the characters to become alive and become meaningful in the way they, they, they behave. Look, I didn't mean to. This, this is never what I wanted. No, come on. Don't, I warned you! Look, I... You can't do this. It will be different things for different people. 
There are so many versions of the story that will either reveal something or show something. And you as the player are revealing how you deal with truth, how you deal with other people's truth. Working in interactive medium, you can make a story that becomes very personal to you, right? You're not passively looking at what's happening and processing. You're actually deciding by allowing you to participate, to change it, to mold the way it's built. In a way, it becomes part of you. It's like you're part of the creative process that is happening. And because the game doesn't really give you a direction, the decisions you make are based on who you are. I'll prove it. Yeah, great. Let's see it. Wow me. That allows you to explore a side of yourself that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. Silently repeat these phrases. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear. May you know peace and joy. If you're not familiar with The Big Con, a coming-of-age comedy adventure about a teen in the 1990s, well, let me explain. You play as Allie, a high school junior who learns that her mom is about to lose her video rental store to loan sharks unless they come up with over $90,000 ASAP. Well, there's clearly only one thing you can do. Run away from band camp, head to the mall, and become a con artist. I mean, that's just common sense. From the decade that gave us the World Wide Web and so, so much plaid, I give you the big con. I'm Dave Proctor from Mighty L Studios, and I am the game director and writer on The Big Con. Uh, Mighty L is a company from Toronto. We're made up of some really, really awesome devs from this city. George Dagenkamp, Saffron Aurora, Tabby Rose, Sakrina Diaz, and Yash Kulkarni is our core team. The Big Con is a adventure game where you hustle your way across 90s America as a teenage con artist. But it's all for a good cause. You are trying to save your mom's video store. So you learn to pickpocket, wear disguises, talk your way into and out of trouble. All for that good, not so good cause of making sure your family business stays afloat. You know, one of the toughest things about making this game was was selling people on the on the non-violent crime aspect of it. Um, games with guns don't bat an eye, but you know, the moment you have to steal an old lady's wallet, people start to think. Uh, maybe there's something wrong with you, um, which is fine. That's part of the fun of making this. It really helps us make something that, you know, challenges people and challenges ourselves and hopefully helps us find a little bit of in-between uh, in a story like this. Ultimately, Allie's doing crimes for a good cause and, um, you know, writing a funny and heartfelt story kind of helps justify those actions. So, you know, on the one hand, we get to make a game that we've never seen before, which is uh, a con artist video game. And on the other hand, we get to kind of couch that in a conversation about small businesses surviving and, you know, a story about a mother and a daughter. And between that and the 90s, it really informed like what we were capable of coming up with in terms of this relationship. Like, who is Linda, uh, Allie's mom, who raised her as a single mom and kept a business together and is tough as hell and what is that person like and what is her daughter like? How do they play off against each other? Allie can be, you know, she can be a teenager, she can be she can be rough, she can be sarcastic. And this is something that we really wanted to see and I think it brings a lot of truth to the game. It makes us laugh it goes in the game that was our that was our rule like we really want you to explore and find stuff random conversations with people that you know some people might see some people might not it makes us happy knowing that it's in there <laughs> and it i think really builds on the feeling of like building your own adventure The 90s are just not 
they're not as done in video games. We want to do it. We want to get in there. The 90s are a time when you don't have cell phones, you don't have the internet, you don't have the ability to look this stuff up if you need to. And it makes it a little bit more believable that you can be a traveling con artist, which I think is part of the charm. And so, you know, with the 90s, means that we also get to do this ripping, colorful palette that Saffron put together. I watched a lot of cartoons growing up. Hey Arnold, Doug, and The Simpsons. They, they sort of set the foundation for this cartoon 90s aesthetic. Bright, contrasting colors, exaggerated features, and like fun geometric patterns. So Allie is a very does what she wants character. She wears her cap backwards. That to me was always the signature look of the cool leader type character that you'd see in a lot of cartoons. You know, she has the ripped jeans, the baggy t-shirt, and she also wears her plaid shirt wrapped around her waist, which is, you know, a, a very, I think, 90s style. The references from the Burblos to music or grunge or um, you know what movies were popular and, and like it, it just we don't want to we don't want to beat you over the head with nostalgia but we want to bring you there we want you to be on this journey with us the big con is the 90s crime adventure you've been waiting for what do you think rad ghost okay i just want to finish off by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this um and to be, you know, in the presence of such incredible, incredible games uh, and really just incredible international talent um, means a lot to a pretty stoked team from Toronto. So uh, we hope to see you there and um, we may try to steal the award anyways. <laughs>